good evening or um, whatever uh, time of the day it is. Uh, and welcome to our second lecture within our fine art lecture series. And I see a lot of familiar faces, which is really nice. Uh, but for those who are here for the first time, fine art is an acronym that which stands for in for the future of European independent art spaces in the period of socially engaged art. Fine Art is a PhD training network supported by the Marie Slodowska Curie Actions of Horizon 2020 European Training Program. This uh, series of public talks is organized uh, joint, uh, joint and jointly led by the universities of Wolverhampton. Uh, they are the coordinators um, of the whole project, then University of Iceland, University of Edinburgh and Zeppelin University from where we di direct the training program. Part of the Fine Art Consortium are also seven partner organizations and I see some of them uh, on screen uh, from all over Europe, namely Iceland University of the Arts, Tensor Console, Warsaw Biennale, Bach, Transit, Vessel, State of Concept. The Fine Art Lecture series will discuss the role, impact and theoretical implications of socially engaged art. And it will from now on take place at, a regular, at regular intervals and be continued with talks by Elena Bogianaki, Kuba Shkreda and Maria Lajalojova and many others. So make a note for the next date, which will uh, be a talk by Ilina Fokianaki from State of Concept Athens on April 29th at uh, 6.30 p.m. Central European time. My name is Karen Vandenberg and I hold the chair of Art Theory and Creating at Zeppelin University and I'm responsible for this training program at um, Fine Art. Today, it is my pleasure to, pleasure to introduce Gregory Cholette. This pleasure is especially great because uh, Gregory can certainly be called one of the most important uh, chroniclers of uh, activist art and socially engaged art. And I think it's fair to say that all those who work on and research in this field can hardly ignore his work. Cholette is a New York based artist, writer, curator and activist. He is author and co-author of several books like Delirium and Resistance, Activist Art and the Crisis of Capitalism or Dark Matter, the book that maybe most of you know um, Art and Politics in the Age of Enterprise Culture. He also co-authored Art as Social Action with Chloe Bass and uh, It's Political Economy Stupid with Oliver Ressler. And these days he's about to finish a book called The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art that will come out this year, I think. And uh, that is where also the title of today's lecture comes from. That is certainly reason enough why we decided to invite him as one of the first speakers in this lecture series. But beyond that, I am also happy to welcome him this afternoon because he is one of the most open-minded, uh, unpretentious and uh, approachable artists I know someone who never sees knowledge as exclusive, but as something to be shared and shared in an open access mode. Gillette himself is a graduate of the Whitney Independent Study Program, uh, the University of California, San Diego and the Cooper, New Cooper Union. Today, he is professor in the Queens College Art Department at the City University of New York City, uh, where he co-funded and co-directs the Social Practice Queens Initiative. 
it says a lot about his um, international reputation that he is also academic advisor in the home workshop program in Beirut and teaches at the art design and the public domain program at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. You may know him primarily as the author of his book Dark Matter, which has unquestionably become part of the reading canon of uh, political and socially oriented theory of contemporary art. But Cholette is also co-founder of several New York City-based art collectives, including Gold Labor. I came to know Greg uh, in 2013 when I interviewed several artists and creators in New York and visited a number of contributors of the book Art Production Beyond the Art Market. It was his former professor and colleague Hans Hake who recommended talking to Cholette as one of the artists of the next generation in the field of institutional critique and activist art. Therefore, I visited um, Greg Cholette in his studio in New York, conducted an interview and later invited him to our university for a workshop and to exhibit his imaginary archive at our university's exhibition space. Um, and against this background, I can only say that Gillette is not simply an extremely inspiring artist and theorist with whom it is a pleasure to work with, but also someone who networks people with each other. And that's also something we can see um, when we look at the participants of today. And who has been running various open archives for many years and who above all uh, knows more about the American history of activist and socially engaged art than almost anyone else I know. He also loves to teach and share his knowledge passionately. And that is why I'm now looking forward to his lecture, The Art of Activism and the Activism of Art. But before I hand over the mic to Greg, I should also give some technical remarks because um, I would like to note that this lecture and also the Q&A session will be recorded. So uh, if you don't want to be on record, then uh, you should uh, simply not ask a question or put your question uh, into the chat, just uh, to be aware that, um, yeah, everything is recorded. Um, yeah, and I'm now very happy to hand over to Greg. Thank you, Karen, so much. It's such a pleasure to be working with you again. And with John, uh, both of you, I appreciate this. Wolverhampton uh, University, Zeppelin University, Iceland and Edinburgh, which I hadn't realized were part of this, welcome. Uh, just one little note on the bio is I also have my PhD from the University of Amsterdam, oh, yes. in case um, you know anyone from the Netherlands is watching, I don't wanna. <laughs> Trift them. Um, anyway, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm going to do. I'm actually. Ha I've pre-recorded -pre my my presentation for reasons, complicated reasons. Some of them just going on here, but I also think it will be an advantage because I've been able to insert images and do a couple things I couldn't do live. Um, you'll be wondering when you watch it. Maybe as you're watching now, you'll see this steam. Uh, we're not on fire here. Uh, if you've spent time in New York City in the winter, you know that the radiator heat dries the air out like crazy. And we have to do this to humidify the air and also for the various kind of tropical plants that I've been trying to grow while we're all in lockdown and COVID. I'm sure some of you have taken up similar hobbies. Um, so the one thing, let's see, I, I put the, okay, so here's the book. I'm putting it in the uh, chat just in case people want to take a quick look. It's still in the works, um, so I can't tell you when it's going to be ready, but there it is. Second link is the text that I'm going to read today. So if you wanted to read along, uh, uh, you could do that using this link that I just gave you. Uh, a third link, and there's just two more before we get done, is to something that I will talk about right at the beginning of the presentation. And that'll make sense when you when you hear me. 
And finally, the last link is the program that Karen uh, spoke about here at Queens College, City University of New York, which is Social Practice Queens. It's, um, it's a part of an MFA program, but we're also about to launch it in a new form through the Graduate Center, and it's gonna turn into Social Practice CUNY. And if anybody's interested, feel free to just get in touch with me. I'll tell you more about that, uh, how, how that's working, but we're trying to bring together the very disparate uh, people teaching in the sort of socially engaged arena around the university. And I'm sure as many of you teach know, people get very, very siloed. And it's very hard to sort of get people to kind of work inter in an interdisciplinary way, also because of the way the bureaucracy works. So we're making an effort to actually bring students and faculty together to really engage this kind of teaching. Uh, just two things about the talk which is about 40 some minutes long. Uh, it, it focuses on not just social practice art, but also on art activism, which is the primary to uh, topic of my new book. Uh, I think I do cover both, but we can, we can sort of focus more on the question of socially engaged social practice art in the Q and A, if you like. And uh, the other thing is it's a little bit of a kind of history mixed in with some ideas and theories that I've been working on for, for a while. So. There we go. I'm gonna launch the, the, uh, the video from my side. If there's any problem technically, let me know right away. One of the things I don't understand about Zoom is why the person sharing the screen doesn't get to see the share so you can tell whether it's working or not, right? Anyway, I'm gonna launch it. Tell me if there's a problem and we'll fix it. Otherwise, I will see you shortly for the Q&A. So come with me and take the quiz, please. Take the quiz, prompts the canny pop-up questionnaire on Tate.org's website. Which art collective do you belong to? Should you be in the Black Audio Film Collective, or are you a hackney flasher at heart? The test refers to a pair of London-based artist groups from the 1970s and 1980s, one focused on the British African diaspora, Black Audio Collective, the other foregrounding working women's rights through photography and public posters, the Hackney Flashers. More questions immediately follow. What makes, you, makes up your collective? What is your mission all about? What inspires you? A click, pause, and like a vintage coin-operated fortune-telling machine, the platform's algorithm reveals your innermost communal proclivities. And somehow, I wound up belonging to the 19th century painting circle known as the Ancients, who gathered at the home of poet William Blake. Don't ask me how. Scrolling down the page, we find information about how to start a movement. In quotes, how to start a movement. Along with short biographies of other, quote, radical art groups. A large button then leads to a five pound membership deal offering discounted tickets and 29% off cafe items puckishly marketed under the brand Tate Collective. I don't want to overstate this next point, and nor do I wish to proclaim that the art world has finally begun to shift away from its adoration of individual authorship towards cooperative forms of production, but the very fact that one of the institutional pillars of high culture is endorsing, however waggishly, collective artistic agency indicates a marked degree of change towards socialized art practices previously relegated, if they appeared at all, to the basement archives. Tate Inc. is not unique in this regard. Before this past year, would it have been possible for Black Lives Matter to top the annual ranking of 100 art world influencers as preferred by the Art Review magazine, online journal, British, in 2020, with the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too movement, in fourth place, close behind. A primary question I will explore today, therefore, is why this embrace of socially engaged and activist art now? Which is to say that before 
those of us, including many who are presenting in this series, who have sought for many years to add critical weight to these practices, take what appears to be a well-deserved victory lap, let us stop to acknowledge that contradictions around issues of fair labor, racial representation, gender equality, and the decolonial politics all remain present within the mainstream art world today. For example, just one year after the Tate Corporation uploaded its which art collective do you belong to questionnaire, more than 100 of its employees went on a labor strike to protest the institution's massive job cutting measures allegedly brought about by the COVID SARS-2 epidemic. I'm certain that most, if not all of the groups listed on the Tate's pop-up quiz would have joined the picket line in solidarity if they were around today. But one significant change from the 1970s is the way these contradictions have become virtually impossible to hide away from the public or from the press. And more importantly, the institutions themselves appear incapable of managing these conflicts, not without drawing high profile reprisals from artists as we shall see. So let's dig a bit deeper into this curious parlay, uneasy parlay that has taken place between a cautious brace of social practice art by the established art world on one hand and the social discontent felt by so many art world constituents and their allies on the other hand. This is not a new phenomenon, of course. In 1971, Hans Hacke's solo exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum was canceled, ostensibly over a few works explicitly tracing New York City's unscrupulous real estate market using data drawn from municipal archives, public archives. Like some art world epidemiologists, the Guggenheim's director, Thomas M. Messer, claimed he was duty bound to block Hawke's work because it was, quote, an alien substance that had entered the art museum organism. Defending his project, curator Edward Fry declared unequivocal support for, quote, the freedom and integrity of this or any other artist's work over and above any question of bureaucratic loyalty to an institution, end quote. Fry was promptly dismissed. To put this in context, the early 1970s was an extraordinary moment of social discontent, or what Herbert Marcuse labeled the Great Refusal. Specifically, Hacke's Guggenheim confrontation took place just a few years after the global student and worker uprisings of 1968, and only a few months before 500,000 people marched on Washington, D.C. to condemn the U.S.-led undeclared war in Vietnam, a conflict that was by then expanded by Nixon and Kissinger to include Laos and Cambodia. In addition, let's remember that 1970 was also in the United States when National Guard's troops shot and killed unarmed students at Kent and Jackson State Universities, as well as when the New York art strike against racism, sexism, repression, and war took place as a form of massive protest. But I want to draw attention to what happened soon after Hakka's exhibition was officially canceled, when an unscripted, or maybe I should say semi-choreographed protest conga line took place, snaking its way down the ramp of the Guggenheim's Frank Lloyd Wright Fifth Avenue building, with artist and filmmaker Yvonne Rainier in the lead and other members of the Collective Art Workers Coalition, of which Hakka was a founding member, though he was not present that day, dancing close behind, hands upon one another's hips. hips. Curiously, the convorting intervention received scant attention at the time. And perhaps this is because when compared to more familiar picket lines, this action was itself too artistic and potentially entertaining. Today, institutions like the Guggenheim are only too happy 
to invite similar performance works to unfold and warm up the cold modernist or sometimes brutalist interior architecture of many museums, while of course also improving ticket sales in a world hooked on distracting distraction and spectacle. Though of course it could not be an improvised act of protest like Rainier and the Art Workers Coalition carried out in 71 because great care and planning is required not to avoid colliding with a museum goer and more importantly not to interfere with works on display. Many lent on the condition of absolute care and supervision. After all, insurance claims alone would easily cancel out the membership benefits of such an equation. But I hardly need to point out to you that staging social affectivity within a normally static visual art museum setting, including international biennales, has become something of a regular feature over the past few years. Think of all the performative projects created for the containable spaces within the Museum of Modern Art, its atrium, and of course the Tate's Turbine Hall. In fact, the newly renovated and reimagined Museum of Modern Art has even turned this combination of stillness and action into a sales pitch, stating, quote, from quietly contemplating a single work to watching live rehearsals in the Kravis studio, you'll find something unexpected and inspiring every time you visit. And then it goes on to list the shops and cafes that one will find inside this experiential palace. Meanwhile, the success of Anna Imhoff's Golden Lion winning project, Faust, performed at the German pavilion of the Venice Biennale in 2019, complete with Doberman Pinschers, undoubtedly assures that the Biennale will continue its new performance art program, which takes place both inside and outside the Arsenale. So before digging into this in a more detailed way, let me draw out this contrast between past forms of art and social engagement and what has been taking place in recent years, especially in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis that arguably politicized so many artists and other creative workers who were already leading a precarious existence as part of the cultural sphere's so-called 99%. Briefly returning to the post-1968 situation, effectively after 1971, after this cancellation, Hakka was blacklisted from most U.S. museums, with the exception of the new museum, though the high-profile Guggenheim cancellation also assured that his practice would henceforth shape what Aruna de Souza describes as, quote, the way subsequent generations of artists have understood the relationship between art and the social world. Artists continued to call attention to the allegedly neutral facade of the mainstream art world throughout the late 1960s and much of the 1970s, including in 1969 with Black Emergency Cultural Coalition's opposition to the Metropolitan Museum's Harlem On My Mind, an exhibition that did not include a single African-American artist, either living or dead. There were also picket lines set up outside the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1970, declaring women now, demanding that more art institutional accountability for the low number of women artists exhibited. 1970 also saw the ad hoc Women's Committee of the Workers Art, art Workers Coalition, a sort of fa faction of the group, uh, Women Artists in Revolution, Women Students and Artists for Black Artist Liberation, uh, the guerrilla art action group, all of these emerged around the time of 69 to 1971. These concerns and these activist practices uh, tick up again around 1976 with the formation of artists meeting for cultural change, in some ways an offshoot of art and language. Uh, the group publishes their own anti-catalog, which demonstrates the profound absence of women and people of color <clears throat> selected to represent 300 years of American art for the Whitney's Bicentennial Exhibition, uh, which was effectively the personal collection of John D. Rockefeller, the Standard Oil Baron, and the, fashion, and the nation's first uh, billionaire. After the 1980s, with the partial exception of the Guerrilla Girls, socially engaged artists sought out ways to work 
fully outside of or as far away from institutional frame of hire as possible. The AIDS activist group Grand Fury created public campaigns displayed as advertising on city buses. The neo-situationist tact tactical media artists such as Electronic Disturbance Theater and Critical Art Ensemble focused on interventions into digital and biological technologies, while community-based social practice artists such as Rick Lowe with his project Row Houses in Houston, Texas, or the maintenance artist Merrill Laterman U. Kelly's produced projects in collaboration with municipal agencies. But fast forward to the present moment, and after several decades of relative disinterest in treating cultural institutions as a site of protest, we find, again, a sweeping resurgence of direct engagement in the mainstream art world. This is especially so since the financial crisis of 2008, in which we find artists becoming increasingly engaged in a wide range of cultural activism, much of it starting off as a means of addressing the art world's stupendously asymmetrical economic structure. This includes groups such as BFA, MFA, PhD, or Occupy Museums, or Debt Fair, or working artists in the greater economy, also known as wage. But soon after, it expands to include system-wide condemnation of high culture's institutional ties to neighborhood gentrification, the fossil fuel industry, pharmaceutical companies, that push opioids, a call for the removal of toxic trustees with links to arms manufacturing, private debt investment, uh, and so-called art-washed income. For example, British Art Collective Liberate Tate carried out six years of actions starting in 2010 in protest of the Tate Museum's petrodollar contributions from British Petroleum. This included dousing a volunteer with thick tar like goo, an action that the group insisted was also an homage to uh, Malevich's Black Square, a painting that was part of an exhibition simultaneously featuring Malevich's work uh, from the early avant-garde. Right? Though never acknowledging the success of such direct art activism on its donor policies, the museum announced an end to its affiliation with BP in 2016. Similarly, Though with less of a conclusive outcome, Gulf Labor Coalition and Global Ultra Luxury Faction, or Gulf, agitated against the Guggenheim Museum's planned Abu Dhabi facility in the United Arab Emirates, boycotting, publicly chastising, debating, and eventually intervening and occupying both the flagship New York Fifth Avenue location and Peggy Guggenheim House in Venice, Italy in 2015. But in 2017, work stopped on the new constructed, uh, new, new museum building, uh, where treatment of migrant construction workers by the UAE is described by Human Rights Watch as seriously exploitative, with internal critiques of the regi regime silenced by imprisonment. Members of the Gulf Labor and Gulf Co groups were themselves put under surveillance and blocked from entry into the UAE, allegedly for security reasons around the same time. Given all of this good trouble, as the late John Lewis called his civil rights activism, let me return to my opening question to ask once again, why the embrace, sometimes awkward embrace perhaps, by mainstream institutions of socially engaged and activist art now? Here's a tentative checklist of possibilities. Naturally, we might first attribute this recent interest in radical art groups and activist art and collectivism to a new generation of art historians, critics, curators, and arts administrators expanding their range of sanctioned cultural production as they displace more object-oriented art world gatekeepers of another generation. And while no doubt uh, this is one important factor, uh, it implies conventional modes of top-down validation, a claim that this paper and myself and all of my work have sought to dispute. A second explanation hinges on the need for major cultural drivers, such as museums, biennials, and art collectors to remain up to date with regard to new art world developments. And who could deny that the current and impressive wave of socially engaged art 
with its myriad array of participatory projects, informal collectives, and racialized aestheticization can only be ignored at the cost of irrelevance. Yet, while this is not entirely incorrect, it neither totally satisfies as an explanation, uh, and nor is it strictly a new phenomenon. In the late 1980s uh, and early 1990s, in a sense coming forward from this period of the 1960s and 70s, a series of high profile exhibitions featured politicized and collective art practices, including the Museum of Modern Arts Committed to Print exhibition in 1988, uh, as well as Group Materials Democracy Project, Martha Rosser's If You Lived Here, which took place between 88 and 89 at the Dia Art Foundation, and the 1993 Whitney Biennial, which was an exhibition that, despite its rather tepid effort at introducing audiences to socially engaged art, even managed to earn the disparaging label politically correct, in quotes. In sum, although art's social agency has repeatedly been forced into temporary visibility, usually as a response to extra artistic circumstances, as was in the case in the 1920s and 30s, and the 1960s and 1970s, and the late 1980s, and we could even go back to the turn of the century with the Russian Revolution, of course, the Mexican Revolution, um, it is just as rapidly submerged again, out of sight. That is, once it appears, it seems to vanish, until it doesn't, or until it won't. And which is the situation I believe we've arrived at today, as the abstract and typically fragmented off-screen presence of cultural labor is materializing into a distinct social agency. This has in turn led to a condition that with apologies to philosopher Giorgio Gambon, I call our bare art world, one in which the presumed sovereignty and freedom of high culture has been stripped clean of its claim to autonomy and in which the economic and political contradictions of bare of art are becoming impossible to conceal, thus its nakedness. First, let's address a stubborn issue. Art was never the exceptional and autonomous human pursuit promised by so many art historians and aestheticians since at least the time of Schiller and Kant. This widely held view renders artistic production a unique mode of human labor, a type of work unmotivated by wages or capital or disciplinary authority. In a word, artistic autonomy came to define human freedom in an all too inviting romance of bourgeois idealism. But whether under capitalism or socialism or anarcho libertarianism, what is defined as artistic culture is always mediated by institutional and ideological structures. And this mediation invariably assists, exploits, or appears to impede the work of the imagination, regardless if it is carried out by professionalized artists compelled to reject their administrative overlords in the name of freedom, or the anti-institutional labor of gritty, underground, street, or samizdar artists, or even those within the vast and unlit sphere, unlit sphere of do-it-yourself, informal, and amateur artists. Forms of informal cultural practice that have become inescapable in recent times, thanks largely to the internet. And yet, what is significant today is that sometime in the late 1980s, the emerging neoliberal economy began subsuming the mythical attributes of artistic labor into the capitalist marketplace as never before. Imagination, creativity, and thinking, quote, outside the box became watchwords of the new economy. Previously ignored, suppressed, or feared, 
these volatile veins of effective value generated by everyday post-industrial life were mined and monetized. Inevitably, this knowledge and creativity exposed art's inherent social productivity. Paradox. And it did so far more profoundly than the wave of post-1968 social art historians and, and practitioners of institutional critique ever imagined, and as we will see in a minute. This dual process of artistic assimilation and institutional unconcealment began ramping up after the collapse of the socialist world in the early 1990s. In the, in the United States in particular, high culture's nearly 50 years of service to the ideology of bourgeois individual freedom suddenly required a substantial reboot. By 1989, the necessity of promoting America's cultural freedom as an ideological contrast to their rival geopolitical hegemon, the Soviet Union, vanishes. And in its place, the National Endowment for the Arts will spend much of the 1990s shifting towards prioritizing utilitarian values, including the social impact of culture and community-based art programs. In other words, the end of the Cold War, art institutions in the US and in other capitalist nations scrambled to, to, to imagine and create a new paradigm that might grant continued state support despite assertions that we had reached the end of history to cite the neo-libertarian theorist uh, Francis Fukuyama and his famous 1992 applica application of Hegel as uh, the triumph of Western capitalism uh, over the socialist East. I think he's since recounted this, uh, this phrase and this thinking. Thus, privatization, marketization, position and propositions that museums might serve as a regional engines of economic co-productivity soon gave birth to projects <clears throat> such as the Guggenheim Bilbao in, in the Basque country in Spain, the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, both of which were dreamt up by former Guggenheim director Thomas Krenz, perhaps the first major museum director to hold an MBA from the Yale School of Management uh, rather than a traditional doctorate in art history. I believe he had an undergraduate degree in art history. But Krenz's mission of harnessing contemporary art's alleged tourist dollar magnetism in order to spur economic growth in financially undeveloped regions became a parody of its own post-Cold War ambition when the Guggenheim Foundation announced the new museum franchise in Abu Dhabi. As we said before, as I said before, a kingdom riven with human rights and migrant labor abuse. Nonetheless, the coup de grace for the notion of artistic autonomy really starts with the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis and the ensuing uprisings. Arab Spring, 15M movement in Madrid, Occupy movement, which soon becomes global. And artists identify very quickly with this idea of the 99%. In fact, artists often play key roles organizing these various occupations, even as contemporary art itself was being so conspicuously entwined with the laws of economic value production. In other words, ensnared in and by capital's increasingly rapid and reoccurring political reach, which means it also it, art, also becomes involved in the crisis of capitalism itself, these reoccurring bubbles and bursts, thus a bare art world. As the late Randy Martin observes, uh, about the overall affect of neoliberal society. Uh, quote, if money was, even in the recent past, what people were thought to be most defensive about than any other subject, the veil, he writes, has in many ways been lifted, end quote. Stripped of all romance, this radically demystified bare art world was no doubt aided by decades of Marxist theory, theorizing and institutional critique, but its delivery to us now at this moment of ceaseless capitalist crisis is largely a result of two forces. First, recession-hardened post-occupy over-indebted artists on the one hand, 
and second, a seemingly irrefutable dose of reality offered up by the culture industry's own managerial elite on the other. And here we can think of many things, but um, not just the career of Thomas Krenz, but uh, the current fascination with NFTs, non-fungible tokens. The art market, it's the art market auctioneer's answer to Bitcoin, right? The only, and only the latest uh, type of bear art bubble, uh, which follows on the heels of art flipping, uh, bundled art, asset investments, and so on and so forth. And if, if anybody wants to explain uh, the NFT more clearly, please uh, step in after I finish my talk. Bear art spreads across a meme-driven cyberspace, leaving high culture exposed and on par now with other objects and practices as high culture's once fantastical privilege of autonomy plunges to earth, where it is submerged in a realm of dark matter, including tactical media, craftivism, do-it-yourself street art, and all the species of socially engaged and activist art uh, that are emerging from the social agency that's been unleashed by the better art world. In it. Uh, and it's, it's been always present with the art world, but now it's organizing, expanding, and spreading throughout institutional spaces. <clears throat> but significantly, while we witness a new surge of engaged artistic resistance on the outside or partially on the outside of institutions, we also find growing unionization movement on the inside. This is quite interesting to me, I think. We can talk about this after, in which museum employees in the US seek better pay and working conditions, but also in many instances, they demand such extra financial improvements as an end to gender and racial workplace bias and greater overall respect for management and senior staff members towards junior staff people. Notably, many of these pro-union museum workers are themselves art-educated graduates with degrees in studio art and art history. This is, in other words, a generation schooled in the deconstruction of art world spaces and ideological facades by the likes of Mar Michael Asher and Hans Hacke, followed by Andrea Fraser and Fred Wilson, and who, after some 50 years of institutional critique, are consciously or perhaps more likely unconsciously, applying these lessons directly to their own precarious art, real art world circumstances. Except this new variant of institutional critique, if you will uh, permit me this uh, somewhat brazen characterization, is not manifest <clears throat> as works of art, or doesn't manifest itself in works of art, but instead involves an intervention by cultural workers for cultural workers. And here we have to think certainly the very term cultural worker uh, has its own you know, peculiar art world etymology with roots in the 1930s, if I'm not mistaken, though much more frequently and problematically used by conceptualists and minimalists in the 1960s as a way to identify with the proletariat. Which is to say that today, art workers are merely art workers. And not just those who make up the creative class or the cognitariat, uh, those part-time website designers and studio assistants with MFAs and so forth, but also the hundreds of highly educated, nominally paid museum employees who install exhibitions, write press releases, serve lattes and biscotti in the museum cafes, clean bathroom stalls, mop floors, and provide security for the multi-million dollar objects that adorn the walls of the white cube citadels that, are, that is fine art. Think of this unsung army as a type of non-reflective dark matter 
a sphere of cultural labor that has always been invisible within plain sight, even as it has maintained and reproduced the foundational logic of the high art industry, including its neoliberal permutation as enterprise culture. Therefore, what began as a demand for a fair slice of high arts cultural assets is also now weakening the always fraught boundary separating art and life, as if to demonstrate in an echo of early, guard, early avant-garde proclamations that the gap between caring for objects and caring for the creative social well-being must henceforth be annulled. Complementing these internal contradictions of an increasingly naked art world is the external, or less external, cascade of artists trying to escape the confines of high culture altogether. Some approaches by some approach this escape by demanding a total decolonization of art and its institutions. For example, go for labor uh, or decolonize this place. <clears throat> All of this might seem to be at bottom another instance of institutional critique, somewhat akin to the 13 demands made by Art Workers Coalition in 1969, in which the group stipulated that the art world must adapt a clear partisan position against racism, sexism, ecological de degradation, and the war in Vietnam. But reforming the ideology of high culture, as with his, was the case with Art Workers Coalition, the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, and Women Art Artists and Revolution in 69, is quite a different gambit from seeking the elimination of the entire foundation on which high culture rests. When the Congolese activist Mozala Diabanza recently and defiantly detached an ancient African artifact from its display pedestal at the K. Brownlee Museum in Paris, and then proceeded to attempt and walk out of the building, all the while loudly proclaiming that, quote, we want our riches back. The implication of this action is not, how do we rethink the ways that these mostly purloined objects can be better displayed and more correctly contextualized? No. The logical outcome of such decolonial thinking and deeds goes far beyond rearranging the deck chairs. It calls into question and calls into doubt the entire cultural paradigm of art inherited from the 19th century, including its implicit conviction that European, mostly Northern European and Anglo-American societies are uniquely suited to study, collect, and interpret the history and artifacts generated by themselves, but also by other peoples, even if these other peoples are located within their own national boundaries as cultural subgroups or migrants or refugees and so forth. Locally and globally, this set of assumptions is being called into question, with a corollary movement of monumenticide against the publicly celebrated legacy of white supremacy. Certainly, monument takedowns have a long and convoluted history. But these actions have been accelerated, especially since May 25, 2020, when George Floyd, an unarmed black man, was suffocated to death by Minneapolis police during an arrest, his death captured on a cell phone by a nearby witness. According to some research, the citizens' video uh, documentation of Floyd's horrific as asphyxiation was viewed some 1.5 billion times between the time of the assault and less than two weeks later on June 5th. Three months later, close to 40 Confederate monuments in the United States were either officially removed or scheduled for removal, with many also taken down through acts of collective civil disobedience. This soon built upon a nearly global wave of monument takedown from South Africa to Belgium, from the Caribbean to the U.S., and also in the north of the U.S., in which memorials, statues, and other public tributes to white supremacist men, and sometimes women, were dethroned, toppled over, deformed, beheaded, tossed in streams, typically with the less easily available plinth or pedestal left behind, although now coded uh, in graffiti that read George Floyd, or Black Lives Matter, or simply BLM. To my mind, these ostensibly bad deeds constitute an attempt to push back against the economic and political crisis and social crisis that has emerged certainly since 2008, but more emphatically 
following the 2016 Brexit and presidential elections. Uh, I'm writing now in the aftermath of uh, four years of stupefying chaos, uh, anti-government chaos uh, from Washington, as well as uh, a climax that occurred on January 6, 2021, when populist right-wing rioters broke out in the Washington, D.C. Uh, capital. I believe we have actually collectively entered into what I call the unpresent, a distinct mutation of capitalist realism, a concept of, cor a concept of course made famous by the late Mark Fisher. For Fisher, capitalist realism was the aestheticization and so-called normalization of post-socialist, post-Cold War capitalism, a historically contingent condition positing itself as the only imaginable reality. All alternatives to the system, so we are led to believe, have either faded, uh, failed, or are now incorporated into capital's spectacularized hegemony as commodified lifestyle choices. Think of counterculture, punk, goth, hip-hop, the obvious examples, but also contemporary art and its faith in a reconstituted concept of the a la carte. Capitalist realism's implicit promise was to offer in exchange for its unchallenged hegemony an assurance that periodic economic and political catastrophes would be followed by a return to business as usual. That is to say, a return to the familiar if monotonous terrain of capitalist realism. What makes the unpresent an unforeseeable variant of Fisher's thesis is the growing sense that our current crisis is not a temporary detour, but is instead a permanent pathological state from which any notion of past or future perceived to be fundamentally different and especially perceived to be fundamentally better than the delirium of our current situation has been so completely excised. More than this, fading fast into inaccessibility was even the memory of the memory that alternative possibilities once existed. Then came weeks of monumenticide last spring, a collective and a highly social cooperative process of wounding or lacerating centuries of a certain dominant historical narrative. And despite the movement's attempt to fully erase public representations of white supremacy, colonialism, patriarchy, class oppression, paradoxically, its destructive negativity served to illuminate memory's lacuna by way of deletion. So in conclusion, both in the 1960s and early 1970s, as well as over the past decade, what typically began as an effort by cultural workers for equitable, equitable pay and greater security swiftly intensifies into a broader program of demands. And because of the forked genealogy of socially engaged art, uh, ever since really maybe 1968, certainly in the post-1968 era, with some practitioners attempting to jettison the art world and the avant-garde altogether in a move theorist Stephen Wright terms escapology, while another branch focused its attention on challenging the art world's internal doctrine of alleged economic and political neutrality. It is the legacy of this dual critique that now confronts and in turn is confronted by a radically denuded bare art world, one that is no longer capable of disguising its dependency on socialized forces of artistic production that maintain and reprodu reproduce its ideological architecture. Raucous public pageants, banner drops, giant puppets, politicized street performances, boycott campaigns, museum occupations, guerrilla monumenticides, demands that compromised individuals be removed from museum boards, and above all else, calls for a total decolonization of high culture suggest that the likely answer to my initial question involving the embrace of socially engaged art by mainstream art institutions is something akin to sympathetic magic, a sort of cargo cult effigy approach intended to hold at bay the far more consequential challenge that activists and socially engaged art agency represents to the art world's unvarnished status quo. To cite John Roberts, radical art 
internalizes, quote, the retroactive and nonlinear latency of revolutionary time in order to unleash the present from the necessities of chronological time. As opposed to clever pop-up quizzes about radicalized art collectives that no longer pose, or at least appear to no longer pose, a threat, I keep thinking of recent COVID-era landscapes dotted with empty monument pedestals, objects collectively transmuted from remnants to revenants. What have these emptied support structures for these monuments become? They're now vacant. They're like perches made of broken concrete or marble, sometimes revealing bare and rusted anchoring bolts jutting up and out of their graffiti-covered surfaces. Weird, uncanny things that keep dragging our eyes and thoughts and sense of identity back over to the holes torn into a surplus archive of cultural time. And it is there, in this incision, that we glimpse a version of the past that once sought to convince us about a seemingly unconflicted world and its stable social hierarchies, but which now speaks to us about our bad new days of unsettled delirium and crisis and unstoppable buoyant rebellion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, okay. Greg. Um, you want to you want to frame it a little bit uh, the recording, or should we just switch into um, Q and A's? There is already a kind of chat uh, going on uh, in the chat. Um, so you want to frame it a little bit? Uh, sure, let's open it up to, to, to questions or clarifications. There's already one clarification. Thank you, Michael, for correcting the date on uh, Artists Meeting for Cultural Change. Um, and you also raised the question around uh, uh, repressive tolerance, Marcuse's famous arguments. Uh, I wasn't completely sure of the specific question there. Maybe you could clarify that a little bit more, Michael. And also the others, you can, if you push the button reaction, you can also uh, raise your oh, hand and you ask question. Oh yeah, But okay. that, there he was, Michael, Michael Corris. If he's still with us. Yes, yeah. I get a chance to speak, okay. Hi. I, I thought you were doing what my students do, they, they vanish and they leave their you know picture up and don't know where they yeah, are. Yeah that's, yeah, that's because they're sleeping. I, I have the same <laughs> experience. Um, well, I was just I was just wondering how far the um, the critique of the conditions of of, of labor within institutions um, is linked to the conditions of what the institutions are also representing besides these works uh, that we can we can approve of or 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 think um, might be embracing it. So when you say embracing this kind of collectivism or even art as social practice projects, um, what really does that embrace mean? And what does it what does it mean for those of us who are involved in those projects uh, in terms of our tolerance towards other forms of art that seem to be pursuing, say, an anti-collectivist position? Um, in other words, yeah, can we continue to to look at the institutions as as liberal systems and behave accordingly? Yeah, good question. Well, I think that of course they're liberal systems. They're going to always be presenting themselves as as a liberal system. I'll give you an anecdote of sorts. Um, when we, as Gulf Labor, began to critique their uh, involvement in Abu Dhabi, uh, some of the some of what we did after the boycott started was actually meet with uh, people at, you know, Armstrong and others at the museum because they wanted to settle this thing. And one of the suggestions they made to us right away was, well, why don't you create an artwork and we'll actually help fund it. And it'll essentially be, they didn't use the term institutional critique, right? And we said, well, that's not really what we're about, you know, we're, 
so you get the point. Um, that's I think I think that's the boundary that these institutions can can go to. They can't go beyond that point. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess then just to follow up and 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 to um, conclude what I wanted to ask, um, where does that leave you and and those people that you're working with as to their next move? In terms of like. I, I well, guess the, I'm struggle, not completely the, struggle, the struggle wouldn't just end because they've they've given you this um, counter proposal. Um, how do you continue? What we did, and what I think everyone is sort of seeking to do, is basically uh, call them back into question. And where you basically said, you know, it's not acceptable that you're telling us uh, it's not. The Guggenheim's problem, but it's the you know, UAE's problem. You know they need to reform. Uh, you're giving them your brand, et cetera, et cetera. And then we continued to do our critique, which uh, then ramped up, as you may know, into these interventions and other projects. Uh, we also were invited, of course, by Oakley and Weser to the Biennale, which got us some funding. Uh, it wasn't so easy to do, but we got some funding, and we went. Uh, some of our people went to. Um, Sajid Island and to UAE and in India and other places where migrant workers were coming from, collected data and we published that uh, material. Uh, that's what probably provoked the UAE uh, to, to basically ban members of our group from actually entering the country supposedly for security reasons. But the point being that we continue the critique and we continue it at a, in a different mode if we have to. Um, not as necessarily institutional critique as artwork. Okay, thanks. To be continued. Sure. <laughs> yeah, Nothing. now there are some more questions in the chat and I would like to ask um, uh, Blake Stimmons, uh, Stimson uh, first, um, whether he might read out or um, explain his question again. No, yeah, thank sorry. you, Greg, uh, for the great talk. I, um, you know, this is a theme that you and I have talked about, you know, uh, a fair amount. But, you know, the question is basically insofar as we might say that the, um, the legacy or the, the tradition that you talked about, uh, you know, which might be said to have been born of the neo Dada anti aestheticism of the 1960s. Um, whether it's uh, in its anti-monumentality and its decolonial impulses in its institutional critique, um, general orientation, whether uh, it's um, risking discarding the, the basis of a viable social alternative. That is to say it's, um, you know, it's it's risking speaking on behalf of the 99% by insisting on the idea of critique. And also, you know, a parallel to this would be um, thinking about the your definition of dark matter, which, you know, as you know, I I think is great. And I think it's great, particularly as a um, as a figure for the the working class generally. But insofar as dark matter becomes something like a um, uh, kind of trade union consciousness, where you're advocating for the uh, the interests of a particular group in a particular industry, then it starts to become something different. It starts to head down the the path that the union movement uh, headed in in the 40s and 50s. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Is there um, in highlighting the anti aesthetic institutional critical tradition, is there a danger that we lose um, the only power that art ever had, um, which was to speak in the name of publicness, speak in the name of the 99%? Yeah, thanks, Blake. Yeah, we've had this discussion so many times in, in different forms. Um, but I think you're, you, know, you put your finger on something and I'm not trying to promote the uh, engagement of uh, the art workers in museums um, 
who are trying to unionize necessarily as a kind of triumph of anything in particular, except to note that it's happening and note that perhaps this is one of my suggestions that it that it comes out of in, in, in fact the reflection on these histories of institutional critique by people who have studied it, who have been presented it in the classroom. I find that an intriguing sort of genealogy. Um, in terms of sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, I think that's a really important question. We don't, I don't know, we, don't, we haven't given that notion up, that uh, idea of, uh, you know, purposeless, purpose, you know, purposeful purposelessness really, even though it seems that so much of what's going on has sort of evacuated that possibility. It seems to me that as long as you kind of bring your work into the realm of artistic critique, you pull that, you pull that blanket right back over and you kind of cover the nakedness of the situation to some degree. I mean, we have to admit to it that it is in part a kind of, you know, a, a sort of concept, it's a fetish, it's, it's, a, it's a notion, uh, it's, it's more of a sort of argument, arguing point, I would say, than it is an absolute verifiable reality. Uh, and I guess that's always the, the, the complication, you know, we could operate out of the naive sense that we're artists, Therefore, we have the right to make this statement for the public, this critical statement. Uh, we are independent, we're free, we're autonomous, we're sovereign to do that. That's our privilege. Um, but I think we all have studied this to such a degree, especially everyone here today, and know that, well, this, that's not exactly really uh, the truth, either historically or either uh, in terms of sort of the theory of art. We know that there's more complication to that. And I think this is where we're, you know, we operate. Uh, the critical part of this has to sort of acknowledge both the sort of mm, somewhat fantastical version of institution of autonomy and institutional critique, and at the same time, in the sense, apply it uh, in a kind of almost ironic way, in a kind of uh, ersatz way, if you will, to continue sort of doing this kind of work. I'm not sure. I don't have a better answer than that right at this particular moment. Thank you, Greg. There's another question from Angela Dimitrakaki. Uh, Angela, you wanna switch on your mic and your camera? Hi, oh, right, sorry, I'll, I'll just mute myself. Hi, Greg and everyone, hello. Yeah. I think we can all read the question, so I haven't got anything to add. It's, it, it's just that um, because we use nowadays the term decolonizing, it's widely used um, and I, I wanted us to uh, reflect on it, to, to think about it, um, if and how it connects to transformative and even revolutionary politics and how uh, the art field or the cultural field comes into it. I mean, I think that um, there is a kind of subtle um, um, operation of accepting here that um, we can return to something, or at least this was part of a discussion uh, in the feminist movement in the in the 70s and I don't know if the term is being used at the moment you know in the same way um, I I think I hope that everybody here uh, um, understands what decolonizing involves uh, its relevance its affiliations and so on but does it imply some kind of return to something rather than abolishing something yeah, great point. And I can't argue it completely because it's not really my area of expertise, but I do, it does come to, to mind this idea of world building uh, that's sometimes uh, set up in, in sort of contrast to the idea of decolonizing, uh, rec the recognition of other kinds of knowledge, epistemes that, you know, operate. Uh, and I certainly, would feel open to those kind of, um, you know, those kind of thoughts. And I, I'm gonna give that a little bit more uh, thinking, Angela, and try to sort of clarify that before I present this again. Thank you. Yeah, since I cannot see a raised hand, um, I wanna ask a question as well. Um, and um, at the beginning of your talk, Greg, you uh, spoke about the longing for an art world, a world um, that gets rid of all toxic trustees, so to say. And I always feel a certain unease when 
I look at actions of uh, decolonized displays, for instance. I, I share their concerns, but I find it irritating um, that it's so self-centered in a way. So the effort here is very much about a clean art world. But is it the world, is the world a better place if there are no more arms dealers in or on a museum board like the Whitney um, struggles were about? Uh, the art world might feel better. But my question is, how do you feel about the, the broader social impact of these museum related actions? Yeah, that's a great point, Karen. And um, I think that I've actually raised the same question with people from Decolonize on a few occasions. It's uh, once you get rid of the Warren Canders at the Whitney, for example, who was involved with this uh, company Safari Land and made supposedly non-lethal weapons, uh, then is it like, well, now we have go back to business as usual. And I think that they would, of course, uh, agree that that's uh, not uh, the case. It's not what they're after, and I don't think anyone's after. I think there's two things going on. Maybe one is the idea that you put forth a fairly bold request, like get rid of a toxic board member, and you don't expect it to actually happen. And then it does happen. And then you're like, okay, well, you know, what's the strategy here beyond that one tactic? Uh, the other, I think, uh, point is, is exactly what you're saying is that, uh, and this maybe comes back to Angela's question, um, is this broader notion of decolonizing or rethinking the whole structure of cultural uh, collecting, interpretation, whatever. Uh, it seems to me that you, once you get rid of a few sort of bad eggs, you are still left with that problem. There's no question about it. And that is maybe uh, a thread that has to be sort of like uh, drawn out more conclusively. Thank you. John. Hello. Hey, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, just, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about your periodization of crisis in relation to to art and, and culture. There's a sense in what you were saying that um, questions around socially engaged art or politicized practice come and go, that they emerge and disappear and then they re-emerge. Yeah. Um, I would. What, what would you say to this? And um, what would you say to? the notion that there has been a qualitative shift in arts relationship to its institutions, certainly in the new millennium. And that we're, I talked a bit, I talked a, um, a bit about this in my lecture three weeks ago. Um, um, what would you say then to the idea that there has been a determinate move away from studio, gallery, sales, nexus, to a position in which um, the artists established their relationship to the production and reception of, of art through forms of social enactment that have nothing to do with the sale, with the sale of objects. And this is something that, of course, has always haunted the, the production of art during the modern period. I mean, we're all very familiar with that. But um, today, it becomes more than a, an artistic option that younger artists might take, but in a way, an absolute necessity in order for them to survive, not um, survive intellectually and artistically. What would you say to all that? Well, I think you you know that you know the book Dark Matter, uh, and you know basically covers exactly this this question in a way. I mean, it sort of raises the question: what happens when, in a sense, uh, you recognize a kind of shadow economy within the art world, uh, and your own notion of a sort of secondary economy, very very similar. Uh, the idea that out of necessity, uh, the the sort of glut of artists that are being produced by the system have to find alternative means. 
for uh, not only production, but also reception work. And this is happening in a kind of very socialized uh, way uh, through not just the, the internet, but in all kinds of other ways uh, prior to this last year, at least anyway, in, in various kinds of informal gatherings and collectives. So uh, that is obviously something that's been going on, I think, in a very profound way for, for a very long time. Uh, and I would say it's well established now. But one of the points I was trying to make, maybe this wasn't as clear, is that in terms of the periodization, uh, what we see recently is the art world itself, of course, turning around and saying, okay, what about this phenomena? Precisely the phenomena you're talking about. How do we sort of bring that into the institutional frame? And the questions, of course, I asked was, well, is that because we have younger curators? Uh, perhaps, I'm sure that's absolutely true, who want to uh, establish a different paradigm for art. Is that exactly as you say, maybe more ephemeral, less object oriented? Uh, is it because people don't want to be left out? They want to make sure they get their NFT before anyone else does in their collection, of course. But I also think that there's incredible pressure on the institution through the various practices that I presented, from the boycotts to the critiques to stealing objects out of museums, that they need to respond to this uh, phenomena that's going on, this new critique of the institution. And in a way, uh, bringing some of this and maybe this is back to Michael's point about repressive tolerance, bringing some of this element in, into the institution as a way to sort of manage that. Uh, I suggested that it's a kind of uh, sympathetic magic or a kind of cargo cult where you, know, you, you create an effigy of the thing, but you don't actually really engage deeply in uh, the practice itself. Well, I, I would say that this, this constitutes a deep shift of the last 25 years and the, um, the turn to... Um, modes of politicized practice or the politicized sensitization of art again um, is um, the that, well that range of surface, surface phenomenon um, that this deep shift has produced and yeah. that's how i would see it yeah no okay. i think I, I i actually cited you right at the end of the paper but that was the moment you you got up and stepped away from the screen, which was quite funny. <laughs> I couldn't stand it anymore, I had to leave. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I, joking. But I think yeah. that uh, the point, in fact, the, the citation I made of yours is precisely around the idea of the concept of the avant garde, which is obviously another whole can of worms, but the idea that it represents a kind of fracture within time, right? Uh, it, it tries to fracture the idea of linear time. Uh, and that's something that's kind of embedded in the very notion of it. And I think that that is a very important element of what's taking place right now, both on both in terms of this kind of outside activism we're talking about, or this dark matter, all these sort of spheres of interconnected uh, informal practices or new ways of sort of presenting and, and, and being an artist, uh, and in terms of this kind of like new critique of the institution itself. Uh, it does have to do, I think, with uh, ultimately, which is why I ended on this idea of the unpresent, with some kind of breakage from this repetitive idea of uh, time that's presented by the system as we now live it. Yes. Thanks. Sure, John. There are two more questions now in the chat. One is by um, Christy Enz Cosme. And um, yeah, I would ask her maybe to. Switch on the mic. Christy, are you there? Hello? Okay, maybe then we take the next one by uh, Daniel Green, oh, or Gein, uh, not, not Green, Daniel Gein. Um, Daniel, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Hello. I think um, he doesn't have access to audio at the moment. So. Oh, okay, then I read it out. Um, there is a sense of hope in the political effic efficacy um, of the emergent civil disobedience that has been extent across the globe in the last year, as you mentioned. What constraints do 
efforts such as the UK government's plans uh, to implement anti-protest politics uh, place on this collective acts of civil disobedience? And uh, do you think that the safety of the art institution offer an alternative space for these actions or will they further strip the political efficiency of these actions as a result of their institutional setting? Yeah, that's a great question, Daniel. Before I respond to you, I'll just say uh, Christy also doesn't have her mic. And I think she raises an interesting point that maybe we're asking a little too much of uh, sort of activists to come up with a solution to the problem of colonization or decolonization or world building uh, in terms of what Angela's question is. Um, although we could have a longer conversation about the question of activism versus politics, and that might be very interesting in the sense uh, or tactics versus strategy. Uh, in terms of Daniel's point, this, this will circles back a bit to what Blake was talking about, the idea that the institution at least has some kind of framework where you can go in and you can make these kind of statements. And that is um, uh, in, in a sense sort of insulated ideally from these kind of actions by governments. And I think that's an excellent important point. We see this even in places like Poland and Hungary where uh, we know the governments have shifted to the far right. And yet within the art worlds in these countries, people are still able to assert uh, a certain degree of uh, dissidence and dissent. Um, and yeah, I think we have to defend that idea of the art institution as a liberal space, uh, Daniel and Blake. Uh, and I, obviously, if these kinds of laws are put into place in the UK of all places, uh, it would certainly be an attraction here as well, maybe not under the current government at the moment, but there's no question what's gonna happen, uh, no telling what's gonna happen in the next two to four years in terms of our own situation in the US. Um, we would need to sort of, uh, even if we're on the left, of course, defend, I think, the idea of the institution, uh, the art institution and other institutions, academia too, as a kind of privileged space. So, I mean, this is the contradiction I think we, we operate with. We, we know how to deconstruct our situation and recognize its problematics in the you know, enlightenment past and all of the roots it has. And yet, it seems to me we absolutely have to sort of against such threats uh, not let the baby get thrown out with the bathwater, as Blake said. It. I don't know if that answers your question, Daniel, but you can type in another uh, response if you want. Yeah, and Chrissy's um, question, does, does she feel like this answers her question? And Christy, feel free yeah. to text yeah. me back. Or, yeah. Yeah. There's another question by Gabor now, Gabor Ehrlich. Okay, terrific. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was just wanting to try to touch up on, on this issue of autonomy, heteronomy, as uh, actually I'm, I'm from Hungary, so it's good that you just mentioned this country. And I'm also someone who, to say it with your words, uh, have my own extensive collection of uh, failed artistic and activistic archives collected from the last like 10 years. And what I was uh, going to touch upon, and I think it will be a good question since uh, I didn't know about your new book coming out, but I was just reading your text um, that was published in Field magazine as a response uh, to Boris Groys uh, called Merciless Aesthetics. And here you were telling something really interesting to me about this autonomy situation in activistic art. So if you don't mind, I will quote just a little bit of it. Um, so quote starts. But what if we shift the perspective to focus on the activism of art, on the activism of art activism? What if we view it as an event object situated potentially in the here and now, and particularly in a time, place, and medium still to come? Uh, perhaps the most unsettling aspect of artistic activism may not be the viral video or spectacular photo photograph, but the moment participants and bystanders are temporarily dis disengaged from familiar social narratives and fo forced to confront their own tacit state of unfreedom. Uh, so my question is basically like twofold. One is uh, whether, if I'm understanding it correctly, you're suggesting that 
artistic activisms or artists who are also engaged in activistic practices would be best trying to kind of add a little more autonomy in the life of people who are like already all too locked in this heteronomous maze of capitalism. And the second one is uh, whether you or in your new, new book are following this, this lead you started at this essay. Thank you. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks for citing the paper. It's one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to answer your second question first, uh, I'm definitely going to be picking up on those themes uh, in the book. It's a very short book. Uh, so I, <laughs> it's, I, just, I just put the whole composed all the chapters together, which they're not finished, they were supposed to be finished. Um, and I realize I'm like, you know, 17,000 words over the limit. So I have to start cutting, cutting, cutting. I'm sure we're all familiar with this, uh, but this is something that I really do want to sort of come back to, but I may not have the chance to explore it in depth because it's not that kind of book. It's really meant to be a kind of introduction to the, to the whole idea of activism. So, uh, in terms of your, uh, the, the, the point and the, and the quote, yeah, what I was trying to work out um, was this problem, I guess, uh, the sense that when you engage in this kind of activism like we have with Gulf labor and other groups, it seems sometimes you can very much reduce it to, let's make something happen so the media picks it up, we get it in the newspapers, and that leverages the media, it leverages other authorities that we don't have access to to do something. And there's no question that when the boycott of the Guggenheim was announced in 2010, and it came across the New York Times and other major newspapers, we got an invitation you know, from David Ar Dan, uh, Armstrong, basically come and talk to us, let's see if we can work this out. That was when the proposal that we, that we make an artwork out of it came up. Uh, so certainly the media is super important in these kind of critiques, but I was trying to sort of think beyond just that notion of the instrumentalization, you might say, or media instrumentalization of these kind of practices and think another way to look at it. Uh, I used the kind of idea of, a, of an event object, something that we think of, mm, not in a traditional sense of an object, but something that actually has this kind of concrete, phenomenal, uh, experiential quality to it. Precisely what you were pointing to, uh, not only for the people engaged in it, uh, but for the people who might be present at the same time when the perfor performance or this inter intervention takes place that they can then map onto their own experience, uh, as you say, uh, this idea of sort of like breaking free from uh, the unfreedom that we live or you know, the lawlessness of the law that imposes itself on us, uh, even if they only glimpse this as a possibility in an art context for a moment or whatever context it is. Uh, I would go so far to say maybe all of these kind of um, actions we've been seeing around Black Lives Matter, uh, what I'm calling monumenticides have to a certain degree done exactly uh, the same thing. I think it asks, it raises the question to people, well, what, you know, why do we put up with this kind of stultifying history of white supremacism, its presence all around us in public spaces, uh, other forms of oppression, when we can go out and make a demand to change it. So I think you put your finger directly on, you know, a key aspect of what activist art uh, can do. Uh, and I would even go beyond obviously the art of activism, which I think in a certain sense, these things are really kind of converging at the present moment. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons I showed who's the most important influential artist, it's Black Lives Matter and the hashtag Me Too movement, right? It's an interesting transformation that people are having with regard to activism in general. Thank you. Yeah, Alexei Pensin, please. Yes, uh, hello, Greg. It's uh, <clears throat> it's really nice and great to see you. And thanks for your paper. Yeah, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wasn't. Uh, I mean, it has many aspects, uh, and I, uh, of course, it's different uh, facets of what you are saying. It's an ex exciting project. I was curious about this as a theorist. I'm curious about this. 
category of unpresent you uh, somehow introduced and uh, for me english is my second language so i even didn't know that there is such, such a flexibility in the language you can uh, use this term so i was just wondering uh, is that somehow related to this discussion of the present in this sort of critical philosophical tradition like walter benjamin yet side thing about this sort of interruption of this chronology imposed by capitalism and somehow reconnection with all these revolutionary moments in the past, or what you also referred to John's uh, uh, kind of phrase on revolutionary time in this respect. So, because I also was thinking about my other American friend, Jody Dean, who uh, recently was so impressed by our reactionary time. So she started to uh, work on a paper or maybe even a book on neo-feudalism. So there is a kind of regression within capitalist itself, <laughs> so which seems even more radical than this sort of kind of paradoxical revolutionary turning into the past. So because of this uh, Trump's time, Brexit you mentioned, this sort of kind of feeling of kind of restructuring of property relation, which somehow resembles this sort of feudal relation, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many kind of, proposals around this discussion about how to define our present or unpresent. So I just was uh, wondering about you, what's your more thoughts, what you would, would be your more th thinking about this point or this recent debate or contempt about the notion of contemporary and post-contemporary, which was also somehow debated among these people like uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Groys or Peter Osborne, who was were trying to somehow reflect on this question of the contemporary as more related to art than to politics, but still. So sorry for a long question that just, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. That's a great question. Uh, I, I think, I mean, you, you put your finger on it immediately. Uh, it absolutely does connect to, to, to John's ideas to Benjamin, to, to Groys, to this idea of, you know, breaking out of the sort of the, uh, the dictates, uh, the confines of a kind of chronological time, the repetition that we experience under capitalism, uh, Benjamin's famous, you know, statement that, the, you know, the crisis is the, or the catastrophe is that things just go on. Uh, absolutely. And this idea of kind of the, the break uh, again, this comes back to uh, Gabor's question about sort of the art, uh, you know, object action, suddenly breaking out of a moment of on freedom, right? So it, it connects to all those things, and I don't think it's anything particularly new or profound in that sense. My my coining of the word it was really like to combine the idea of the uncanny present wow. into one, um, and to sort of, but also to reflect what has happened, which I started to track this kind of in a very specific way. Um, and looking at all the ways that the media uses the term since 2016, in particular, uh -huh. uh, surreal, uh, you know, uh, bizarre, upside down, uh, unbelievable question. It's and it's just, un, in, you know, it's, it's like a phenomenon in itself, how the, even the mainstream talks about uh, the way we seem to be living in something. And I'll put it this way, that appears to be what it was. It doesn't look too different, except something is off. It's like that moment in the original version of the invasion of the body snatchers, if you recall the beginning, which I, we, we should play this, where the, uh, the doctor, who is of course the protagonist, uh, comes to, to visit uh, one of his patients and her uncle is mowing the lawn, nice Southern California community, everything looks normal. He's got his pipe in his mouth. Somehow he's managing to mow the lawn at the same time. I don't know how you do that. And she says to him in a whisper, it looks like, you know, Uncle Bob, but it's not Uncle Bob. And this is the sort of notion of this kind of, there's nothing outwardly different, but we know it's like something's completely radically changed, right? So this is kind of what I was trying to sort of uh, get at, as if this kind of idea of, capitalist realism could be turned up even fuller volume than uh, Mark Fisher sort of proposed. And then what do we do? You know, how do we sort of think about rupturing something that just seems uh, not only to be a, like a detour from reality, but now we're like on that detour permanently. We're not going back. Great, thank you. 
very nice anecdote. Um, there is another question by Antonio Serna. Uh, Antonio, do you have a mic? Okay, I do. there you are. Yeah. Hey, Greg. Uh, thanks for everyone for hosting this wonderful talk. Um, I think I was just in dialogue with Gregory a while ago on this aspect of uh, the governance. Uh, I, I noticed in your, um, your talk, you kind of mostly focus on artists and institutions, but you left out artist groups like Arts and Labor and People's Cultural Plan, which I was a part of. That also brought in the third dimension of governance uh, in local address and municipal, and then also in the community uh, community cultural board, uh, community boards that exist in New York City. Um, is What was your analysis on that? Is there a reason why you left them out? Um, and uh, to that point, we want to, if we want to go back to the 20s, this was a point I was trying to make. We're in such a dire uh, uh, bankrupt state that it has become an issue of looking at the 20s and 30s when artists did petition uh, the change of institutions or the, or the production of of new art through government funding directly, uh, which might be different in Europe, I, I, I understand that. But just curious what your thoughts <clears throat> on that aspect <clears throat> and those groups that also take this third, third route as well. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Antonio. And I would say, um, it, you know, shame on me. This is really more of an oversight on my part, uh, something that I can also sort of like uh, add in to some of the other corrections people have raised, because if that's a really, intriguing uh, aspect of what you're talking about. Uh, the groups you're talking about, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit more about in a second, come out of Occupy in, in a large way, right? Uh, they were organized in that sort of exciting moment, 2012 or so, um, and then sort of like developed into all kinds of interesting ways. Um, this question of governance, I think it's back to the, maybe the issue Christy raised and others about activism versus maybe politics, if I could, uh, and this is something where, you know, also Blake and I have written about this in other respects, like Stimson and I, um, this idea that we think of ourselves as, you know, activists uh, kind of, but in a free floating way, we're just in a state of resistance as opposed to trying to sort of sort out these questions of potential alternative governance, precisely what you brought up. And I think that's, um, that's a really challenging problem for the left because in many respects, uh, not the left going back to the 20s and 30s that you reference, which was then driven by party formation. And I know my anarchist friends are gonna be very upset with that, but it's still, you know, let's face it, communist party and to some extent other parties uh, were really sort of like the driving force of the left discussion at that time. We don't have that today. In fact, I would say, much of the left, uh, and I'm talking now not about liberals, but of the left, have identified, uh, interestingly enough, with the far right insofar as they critique and are suspicious of any kind of governance, right? And I think that has allowed uh, this kind of Mack truck, you know, of Donald Trump and Trumpism, among other uh, isms all around, you know, in, around the world, Hungary, uh, Brazil, you name it, to sort of drive right through the center of the sort of democratic liberal democracy. Um, and and that's, that's a real problem. And so I precisely agree with you that we, we on the left need to begin to think about this question of governance and perhaps even state. Uh, how does the state operate maybe in some kind of uh, sense beyond where we're at? Uh, and I think that's an excellent point. Could you just tell people though briefly about the plan that was developed for uh, for New York? Because it's really fascinating. Right. Uh, yeah. So the People's Cultural Plan, which came after Arts and Labor, and Arts and Labor was specifically focused on creating solidarity between artists and art workers and people in the industry, uh, with uh, connection also connecting with community groups and understanding the role of labor on a local level because it wasn't that these communities didn't exist, but the art world definitely avoids them at all costs or tries to do little or superficial change in those communities to really, uh, just to get by. But uh, uh, more, more pointedly, I think the People's Cultural Plan was a kind of uh, broad coalition of artists and activists who came together. And it was, it was definitely activists, activists who weren't in the art realm, but came together to pitch in their ideas that they had been building over you know, the past decade of, of how this 
this, this system of, of funding institutions can change and how we can move away from these monolithic entities that keep receiving all the central funding from the city and perpetuating through education, through uh, all sorts of programming, the, the monolithic, you know, hegemonic, uh, uh, white supremacist uh, focused art agenda, I guess. Um, and so that was a loose, a loose uh, group, but, but together we were able to cobble up, uh, you know, several page document that then we presented to the city and had all these groups standing behind it at the same time, which gave them no choice but to try to implement these as best they could and we're still chasing those uh, those promises, which have you know since then realized they have no teeth because there wasn't any real uh, uh, put there wasn't money put into those initiatives. So it's kind of just fallen flat again into this repetitive cycle of just letting those with access continue to get the media attention and also funding for the city, and then move forward together as a unified city to pre present culture to the world um, as a New York cultural capital of the world. So that's that's that group. I don't know if there's any specific uh, other questions, but. Thank you. I, I put a link to the plan in the, in the chat. People can take a look. Uh, I think, I think you know, what, just to underscore what you're saying is, uh, you know, any of these big cities, they have a chunk of money. We have a, the most, I think, in the United States in New York City. And we have our own sort of, you know, commissioner of art, which I think is unique to, to the states. But of course, who gets the lion's share of uh, the available funds? It's the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's the MoMA. It's, it's you know, these large institutions, uh, Brooklyn Museum and so forth, uh, the Metropolitan Opera and, and so on and so forth. And I think the, the plan in a sense was to say, well, how do we make this much more uh, fair and more horizontal sort of um, kind of uh, practice? process. But as you say, it, it hasn't had much uh, traction and for all kinds of reasons, even under a fairly progressive oriented, and people will disagree with me about this mayor that we have at the moment. Um, are you organizing and looking towards the possibility of the next mayoral race as something that could be put onto the agenda for a, a potential candidate? Antonio? Um, Oh, the, I, I think the I think the focus now is within a lot of the activist groups is to really bring to the attention that all these uh, sy symptomatic things are not going away, and that this is a kind of time to kind of rebuild. And it's the city, whether they're with us or they're not with us, they have to be more obvious about their choices on how they're going to support, uh, you know, provide a provide a, a safety net for workers who've lost their jobs during COVID. Like it can't, it can't happen again that, you know, 75% of the whole workforce has, has been gone from the arts industry. It's an incredible devastation. And uh, we're still luckily not seeing the end of that because the, the rent, rent moratoriums are still up till, till May, but we have about 1.4 million evictions set to go, still about 1.4 million uh, unemployed and a 10 to 13% unemployment rate in the city. It is no joke. It is completely bottomed out here. So that's that's the last bits that we're fighting for in that sense. Less so of which candidate. If there's a candidate that would support it, great. But um, but uh, not definitely focused on that particularly. This discussion brings me to another point, um, Greg. Thank you for that. Um, because I was asking myself also when I reconsider your talk, uh, it was very strongly focused on the US, right? And um, I know that you're very interested in a, a more global view and that you always invite other people to contribute uh, their views. And uh, I would be interested in how you see the relationship between uh, the US and this uh, specific relationship between the, the so-called um, yeah, gallery, museum, market nexus in the US. And uh, how do you observe it in other countries? I know that you are quite related to Belarus, for example. Uh, do you see very, very different uh, relations there? Um, yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think one always gets a little nervous about trying to represent uh, any other country, uh, including New Jersey for that matter, 
uh, as a New Yorker, you know, you sort of are in your own kind of somewhat provincial uh, bubble. Um, so I'm cautious about, you know, making too much uh, a, a definitive statement and appreciate the people who do live in these countries or who are even in exile in many cases, as many Belarusian artists and activists are now uh, thinking back on, you know, or observing what's happening, let's say in their own country. Uh, we can, it's just so many examples at the moment from, you know, Brazil to Colombia to Mexico to, uh, I mean, the list is just unbelievable of what's going on in Bangladesh. Hong Kong at the moment, of course, is in this incredible uh, moment with uh, all kinds of activism that was taking place in the streets among young people, among artists, to the point where uh, this pretty much, I would say, maybe almost demonstrates this kind of merging between activism and art activism. It's almost impossible to disconnect one from the other. You know, it's a kind of culture of activism and a kind of activism of culture at the same time. Um, it's also happening, as you point out, in Belarus. And again, I'm not enough of an expert, but I could ask my, my wife, uh, Olga Kabrenkin, to say just a few things if, if we have time, because she's just written a very good paper on exactly the situation and uh, looking for someplace to publish it. Would you, do you want to say so? This is Olga Kabrenkin. Let me just, um, I don't think, I'll take uh, a peek. <laughs> hi, hi. Hi, Karen. Uh, I, I guess I know a, a couple of people here. Um, uh, I just, I'm gonna be very sure that responding to the uh, something that is happening in Belarus and your question, um, so that there are a bunch of places um, that were open in Belarus and that was the good news, um, but it was uh, open uh, as a result of liberalization of uh cultural funding and uh creation of certain um in, in infrastructure right that would um, allow artists to exhibit their works not only in the soviet style art uh, museums and institutions that were actually still preserved in belarus in a certain degree uh, uh, but also create the alternative uh, art spaces you know, like in every other country that undergone this uh, privatization and um, I mean, former socialist bloc and liberalization. So the, all these places have closed, you know. So these cultural clusters, you know, that were created by some banks, you know, and um, uh, private business, um, you know, they, they have been closing. Uh, also because of the political crisis, because many of them, uh, some of them were arrested uh, as uh, suspects for being involved in their, uh, you know, this uh, protests. Uh, some of them are still in jail. And I think it's a, as a matter of safety and uh, kind of guarantees of the uh soon release maybe this is why they decided to close a lot of spaces so it's very interesting how the cultural spaces and galleries alternative spaces became involved you know and this um and became also suspects you know uh, the fact that they had been involved in their for forming and brewing this kind of cultural disobedience uh was kind of obvious but uh, we never knew that they, they were also suspects, you know, that they became a suspects in this political prosecution. Anyway, I'm gonna- Great. Give. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah, so much. I mean, it's, much. It's, it's, it's fascinating, I mean, and, and disturbing of course, but um, it, it is a movement though that has very, um, sort of like repurposing a lot of imagery and forms from the traditional avant-garde and other kind of movements to um, make it to be useful within sort of uh, the situation in Belarus, including uh, references to Marc Chagall and Chaim Satin and other artists who were Belarusian uh, and persecuted because they were Jews, of course, in the past, people wearing t-shirts with these artists on it. It's almost like the way um, you think about uh, Picasso's classic Guernica constantly becomes kind of like this icon 
to fill new content in. So it's you know, a version of Guernica for, let's say, Palestine or a Guernica for some other cause. Uh, this idea of the repurposing of imagery is really fascinating to me. And this is where I would bring in this question of the avant-garde, because for me, a lot of what activist art is about is repurposing aspects of other artistic movements and cultures, including the avant-garde, to some extent, maybe the neo-avant-garde, uh, without sort of having to feel like it has to be in some way uh, along some kind of continuum or telos that comes out of this kind of tradition. And so you end up with this kind of, from a certain perspective, you look at it and you go, what do, what do we have? Puppets, banner drops, installations, uh, you know, sound pieces, all kinds of things. There doesn't seem to be any cohesion to it in a formal sense. It's very difficult to present this as, well, here's the new vanguard movement. But my point would be that activist art is not a movement. It's certainly, if there's no school, you know, it's not like cubism, but there are no like list of people who you could say, well, these were activist artists. You could talk about Courbet, but he's also, you know, he's just, he was a painter, but he also happened to be engaged in the commune. The point being that it's more of a phenomena within uh, art and art history. In fact, as Kim Charnley says, it's really a glitch in a sense, you know, a kind of like error code within the very notion of art history and not in itself a kind of movement uh, per se or school or anything else. Thank you very much for this, uh, Greg. I don't see more questions in the chat. And um, concerning working conditions, I think of Elena, who is the technical uh, supervisor from um, from Wolverhampton and might uh, like to leave for the weekend now. Uh, and we have nearly uh, reached um, seven o'clock here, six o'clock at uh, uh, in in Wolverhampton. Uh, it's Friday night, um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for all who attended the talk. I hope you will be um, our um, discussion panelists, whatsoever, um, on the 29th of April, when Angela Dimitrikaki will um, will uh, host the talk, and Ilyana. Fokianaki will uh, talk from um, another perspective from Greece because he, uh, she is uh, one of the creators and directors of State of Concept. And I'm very much looking forward to this next talk in our lecture series. And yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you, especially for you, um, uh, Greg, for um, presenting this wonderful talk. Uh, this wonderful uh, recorded talk that you all, uh, if you are interested, I think you can see it on online now, if you want to. I have it, hear it again, uh, but I can make it available. I'll put it in the chat so people can, I'm probably going to make a few changes to fix up some of the things that we discussed. And uh, let's see, here it is. I'll put it in the chat right now. Thank you all for uh, hanging in there, so, so many great questions. And again, thank you, Karen and John for organizing, it's great. And Elena, yeah, terrific in the background, but yeah, essential. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Bye. It's a pleasure. Thank you, bye. 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 bye.